The LA Times perfectly summarized L7's image, saying L7 causes nightclub ceilings to rain sweat, small women to dive off stages, and entire crowds to shake their heads rhythmically, violently to the beat. Its sound is characterized by howls and throbbing waves of distorted fuzz guitar. It's imaged by torn jeans, wild hair, and whatever shirts its members happen to have been wearing that day. The members of L7 were all LA transplants, with the exception of bassist Jennifer Finch, who grew up near the city. The group's origins began with guitarists and vocalists Susie Gardner and Donita Sparks, who met in the mid-80s. Up until this point, the pair were playing in separate pop acts around LA, with Gardner telling Spin Magazine, Donita and I met each other in 1985. We'd been floating around the same town, kind of following each other in jobs and bands, even with dudes. We had a lot of people telling us that we ought to meet, she'd say. After finally meeting, Sparks would play Gardner some of the material she was working on, and they seemed to gel pretty quickly. Sparks herself was a native of Chicago, who was a rebel from the get-go, learning to question everything. That attitude was instilled by her parents, who would bring her to political rallies as a child. But the music scene in Chicago never really spoke to Sparks, so she moved out west to LA and got a writing job at LA Weekly, while also playing in bands. The classic lineup of L7 didn't come together overnight, as Gardner and Sparks had what they called, and I quote, the psycho rhythm section, before bassist Jennifer Finch joined in 1987, and the band at this point had a male drummer, but the following year Dee Placas came on board. The classic lineup of L7 would finally be born, and the group's name would be derived from a mid-century slang for square. L7 soon developed a name for themselves through their live shows, which saw them blow away the headliners. They became staples of popular Hollywood hotspots like Raji's, Club Lingerie, and The Gaslight. And the band would soon draw comparisons to punk pioneers, the Ramones, with Joey Ramone taking it as a compliment, telling Spin Magazine, They're fun, they're exciting, and they're spirited. That's how I feel we played a major role in inspiring them, and we're proud of it. In addition to the Ramones, L7 would also cite a female band from San Francisco called Frightwig as also being a huge influence on them. From the beginning, L7 had two goals in mind. One was to tour the United States, and the other was to tour Europe. In order to facilitate their first goal, they had to release a record, which they did in 1988 with indie label Epitaph. But sadly, the label would fold several months after their debut LP came out. And without a label, L7 would soon hook up with Seattle band Catbutt, who happened to have one member who worked for Sub Pop. It was that connection that led L7 to signing with Sub Pop, becoming the only LA band on their roster. Sparks would reveal in the book Runge is Dead, L7 had toured the country in 1988, but we had never played Seattle. We were fortunate enough to hook up with Catbutt and headed up to Seattle. My first impression of the town was flyers everywhere. It just seemed very alive, very youthful. The music community seemed really connected for my eyes, she'd say. Sub Pop seemed to be the perfect partner for the band to reach their second goal of touring Europe. Jennifer Finch would tell the Orlando Sentinel that Sub Pop was, and I quote, the gateway to Europe. While signed to Sub Pop, L7 would release a 7-inch single on their collector subscription series, and it would soon be followed up with an EP in 1990. Because of their connection to Sub Pop, L7 soon became regulars at clubs around Seattle, and it got to the point that a lot of people started to think the band was from Seattle instead of LA. While the band had a lot to celebrate, being an all-girl group also came with a lot of sexism and hardships, as industry people and some music fans lumped them incorrectly as part of the Riot Girl movement or just another female rock band. In an interview with Spin Magazine, the article would state, What L7 doesn't want to be is a woman's band, either in genre or in audience. There was the girl band thing, there was the Foxcore farce, there was the Seattle band farce, there was the grunge rock thing, Sparks says. We've been around longer than all that stuff. Basically, we're a rock band from Los Angeles. When we formed, we just wanted people to play with Gardner says. We didn't care what set of organs they had, we just wanted to F and rock. The band members also weren't immune from misbehaving music business types as one promoter sexually harassed one of the members, resulting in the band going to the bathroom in his hat. In the book Grunge is Dead, L7 would take a shot at the feminist Riot Girl movement with Sparks saying, We're not a Riot Girl band. I remember once seeing one of the bands passing out flyers but not passing out any flyers to men in the room. Other than that, I don't really know completely what their agenda was. It was never really my bag. In one interview I read with the band, they would claim that almost 90% of their audience live shows were men. Given their rising popularity around Seattle and the fact that they were on Sub Pop, the band soon became friends with Nirvana and even opened for them in 1990. This was during the time when Kurt Cobain and company were being wined and dined by record labels while they were road testing songs including Smells Like Teen Spirit. Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl would tell Rolling Stone, 
One of the first people to say they thought Nevermind was going to be huge was Donita Sparks of L7, and I didn't believe her. I was going, there's absolutely no way. While the band was no stranger to major record labels and entertained their fair share of offers, there were several problems. One was that labels had no clue how to market L7, and the other was that by signing to a major label, they may lose their credibility, creativity, and identity. Following their stint with Sub Pop, they would sign with Slash Reprise Records, with Finch telling the Orlando Sentinel, At the top of our agenda was distribution, and we've run into problems with both of our previous indie releases. Slash acts as an indie, although they have major distribution, she would say. For their next record, the band would relocate to Madison, Wisconsin, and record with Nirvana Smashing Pumpkins producer Butch Vig for their first release with Slash Records. Madison was chosen to get away from the distractions of big cities like New York and LA. The resulting album would be 1992's Bricks Are Heavy, which would be a career high for the band and produce their biggest single with Pretend We're Dead. The album would peak at number 160 on the Billboard charts, and Sparks would tell Spin Magazine the origins of the song, revealing, I was in my apartment in Echo Park listening to the cassette I'd made, trying to write some lyrics. I was heartbroken at the time, I was actually devastated, and the first thing that came to my mind was, I just pretend that you're dead. And I didn't mean it in a malicious way, not like I wanted him dead or anything, but I truly felt the only way I could get through this was to pretend this guy was dead. Then it became kind of a commentary on Reagan Bush era apathy, she'd say. In a separate interview, Sparks would tell Louder Sound, looking back at the band's big break with Bricks Are Heavy, we were just like slugging it out in the underground in LA for many years. By the time it hit, it was just like about effing time. We had peers that were getting signed and stuff too, so it felt like we were sort of pranksters from the underground, the underdog band, she'd say. Not everyone though was celebrating L7's jump to a bigger label, with Finch recalling the Orlando Sentinel. We'd been around for so long that we had a strong fan base that's really on our side. But there's been some problems with Maximum Rock and Roll, an alternative scene magazine. They really have the idea that there should be fanzines, record companies, distributors, and bands such as ours all working together to create this beautiful independent scene. We gave that six years of our lives and tried to make it work, and we felt that going to Slash was really a compromise. It was really difficult for us. I think we've become a better band and a little more diverse, but I certainly don't think that we're churning out upper echelon mainstream hits, she'd say. Slash Records would offer L7 some big time touring opportunities, opening for the likes of the Beastie Boys, whose crowds were sometimes less than receptive. The promotional tour for Bricks Are Heavy landed the band in hot water across the pond in the UK. During an appearance on the UK variety television show The Word, Sparks would drop her pants during the band's performance. The day L7 appeared on the program, the show presented a bare butt competition and secretly recorded guest Oliver Reed, who was drunk in the green room. Sparks was angry at the show's treatment of Reed and dropped her pants on TV, telling Louder Sound, that was a really long day. The other artists on the show were cool, but I thought it was a bit mean-spirited the way they had a hidden camera on Oliver Reed's dressing room. I don't know, parts of the show seemed slightly mean-spirited, and I wanted to F shit up. In the summer of 1992, L7 would perform at the Reading Festival. That year, L7 performed on a Sunday, which was mostly made up of so-called grunge bands or alternative acts, including the Melvins, Screaming Trees, Mud Honey, and Nirvana. And the news surrounding the festival was heavily dominated by the birth of Kurt Cobain's daughter and the health of Nirvana's frontman. According to the Guardian newspaper, there were conflicting reports over exactly what happened that day during L7's performance. According to one review by The Independent, it claimed L7 was pelted with mud for, and I quote, apparently for the crime of not being men, but the story doesn't seem to check out as Mud Honey, who played the same day, were also hit with mud. Most of the other stories claim that the band was having technical difficulties with their audio and onstage equipment. As a sign of protest, frontwoman Danita Sparks would remove her tampon on stage and throw it into the crowd. It was during the same time period that L7 started championing a number of political causes, including reproductive rights and protecting the environment, the later of which earned the band a lot of death threats. Sparks would tell Spin Magazine that their activism soon fell by the wayside later on in their career, as a lot of press interviews focused solely on their political opinions instead of their music. Two years after Bricks Are Heavy was released, the music scene had changed. Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain was dead, and a new era of bands were taking over, including Green Day, The Offspring, and Britpop. The years on the road promoting Bricks Are Heavy took a heavy toll on L7, with drugs and alcohol soon becoming the main focus of a lot of the band members. In 1994, the band would release a much darker album, Hungry for Stink, and Sparks would look back at the album telling Louder Sound, Hungry for Stink is darker. I think I was in a bit of a mood at that point. I was just in a dark place. That is reflected on songs like Baggage and My Sanity, and it's not a super joyous album. We've always been a band that had shit going down even when things were on the upswing. 
By 1996, bassist Jennifer Finch would leave the group, and she would attribute her exit to financial disagreements, concerns with her health, in addition to dealing with the loss of her father. By 1997, L7 would be dropped by Slash Records. The band once again went the indie route, forming their own label called Wax Tadpole. They would put out their album Slap Happy in 1999 and partnered up with a label called Bong Load Records that was supposed to help license, market, and distribute the record. Billboard magazine in 1999 would interview several record retailers who admitted that the buzz around the band had died down from almost half a decade earlier. One retailer in New York called Rocks In Your Head would tell the magazine, L7 peaked six or seven years ago. They were part of the promising waves of all female bands, including Babes in Toyland and Bikini Kill. It seems like L7's audience has gotten smaller, they would say. It was around the time of Slap Happy being released that L7's distributor would close the stores and offer to sell copies of the album back to the band, but they couldn't afford it, so the leftover copies ended up in a landfill. It was around the new millennium that Gardner quit the band, and by 2001 they were finished. In the years that followed, the former members would pursue other musical projects, but by the 2010s things were set in motion for a full reunion of the classic lineup. The roots of the reunion began in 2011 when bassist Jennifer Finch was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Sparks would reach out to her former bandmate, and at the time Sparks and Gardner only lived several blocks away, but the pair hadn't spoken in nearly a decade. For Gardner, music had taken a back seat in her life as she was taking care of her mother. But soon enough, the band was back together with drummer Dee Plackus by 2014. They would tour extensively in the years that followed, and also released a documentary titled Pretend We're Dead. The band would release their latest album in 2019 called Scatter the Rats. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. I'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.